In the current version of Dungeons & Dragons, the average character is supposed to be able to walk 30 feet in one turn, and that's supposed to take about six seconds. Turns out to be pretty realistic, and uh, I didn't actually just measure that, but trust me, I did a whole video on this already. One, two, three, four, five. <laughs> but there's an extremely popular rules variant, playing on a grid that takes movement in any direction and makes it a lot less natural and a lot more gamified by counting squares, each one representing five feet. And like a board game, this is associated with greater tactics and strategy. Intuitive movement in any direction versus tactical movement in simplified directions. Both of these modes of play are fun, but they are fun for different reasons and best suited for different situations. So we're gonna break those down. Because I'm Bob, this is where we learned how to have more fun playing RPGs together. And yeah, it might surprise you to learn, or relearn perhaps, that grids are in fact a variant rule in 5e D&D, not intended as the default mode of play for combat. It certainly surprised me when I was researching this topic because with every group I've played with, besides my very first group, but we'll get back to that, every other group used a grid for combat. So please tell me in the comments, what is your current group's most common way to handle combat in games like Dungeons and Dragons? Grid or no grid? While I share these 2016 poll results from Return of the Lazy DM, where out of 6,600 people, roughly 60% said five foot grid and about 40% said a non-grid method, either abstract maps or theater of mind. But that poll is almost 10 years old. Since then, we've seen an explosion of popularity in games like D&D, and more importantly, for our discussion anyway, an explosion in the popularity of virtual tabletops, VTTs, which facilitate online play and which often use a grid as the default, furthering this idea that grids are the default. Okay, so if they're not really the default or supposed to be, why are grids so popular? We have to start this answer by glossing over a ton of history. D&D has its roots in wargaming, which typically had a defined scale. And 10 to 1 is a nice clean ratio that's easy to remember. So 10 feet for every 1 inch on the table was the inspiration for classic D&D's 10 foot wide dungeon corridors. As an artifact of that classic scale, that's why the infamous gelatinous cube creature is still 10 by 10 feet, because it could perfectly fill the dungeon corridors of old. Grids as a tool have always been there for representing space. These squares help a game master know whether or not a character stepped on a trap, or know who's in front of the group when they walk straight into a gelatinous cube, or who's in the back of the group when they turn to run, only to see that the corridor has become a dead end. Yes, this is one of the 40 new monsters in my upcoming book, Delve, designed to make dungeons more fun in 5e and even in Shadow Dark RPG, which is already really good at dungeons. It's just a giant snail with a stony shell that eventually grows to fill whatever space it's in, meaning in ancient dungeons, this animal becomes a moving wall that can inadvertently change the layout of a dungeon or accidentally crush adventurers. It has some other fun features that I don't want to give away, but definitely go grab the free sample PDF with some other monsters, magic items, and player options from Delve through the link below, then back the project to get the full 200 and plus page book packed with tips, tools, tables, and materials for building and surviving fun dungeons. Thank you. So 10 to 1 grids sprouted from these classic dungeons, but during the 1990s, near the end of second edition D&D, five foot squares started becoming the new hotness, for combat anyway. More and more game mechanics then supported this style of play, and that was the future. Flanking, another variant rule in 5e D&D, allows two allies to stand on opposite sides of an enemy creature and gain a little bonus on attacks against that creature. It makes positioning interesting and tactical, even in a flat, featureless plane. That's pretty cool. Opportunity attacks mean that in the moment an enemy creature moves out of your reach, you get to make one last strike at them, and this makes creatures or effects that can avoid this free attack highly mobile during combat 
and they get to feel pretty cool about doing that. And area spells or other effects can be literally mapped onto a grid to determine exactly which creatures can or cannot be targeted, encouraging the attacker and their allies to strategically position themselves or to try to force more of the enemies into that targeted area. Ooh, and it feels good when you get it right. A little bonus here, an extra attack there, a buff or a debuff on a group of creatures, each of these elements and more could mean the difference between life and death during battle. And that costly decision making is what makes the five foot grid exciting during combat. But if grids are so great, why did my first group not use them? And more importantly, why after using a grid for about six years straight with all those perks, did I stop using a grid over a year ago? Okay, well the first answer is very easy. My first GM just didn't present grids as an option, so we didn't really know that was a thing. We mostly played theater of mind for all three pillars of the game, social interaction, exploration, and combat. However, we usually had six or so players at the table, and if a battle involved a bunch of adversaries, the GM would typically grab a big blank sheet of paper from his sketchbook, quickly label a few features of the battlefield, then use X's and O's or other symbols to indicate where everyone was positioned. We measured movement by what seemed a reasonable distance, rarely if ever saying how many feet things actually were from each other. This method is usually called an abstract map because there isn't necessarily a scale and everything on it is just a symbol. Though personally, I prefer the term map or maybe gridless map because every kind of map is an abstraction of what it depicts. Neither the world nor any fun dungeon is strictly right angles. Except in Minecraft. I guess it works in Minecraft. Okay, but then what makes the gridless map a fun alternative? Or technically, why is the gridless map the default rules as written mode of play for combat in D&D 5e? And why did I switch back to using it with no regrets? One, flexibility. It takes almost no time at all for the GM to prepare a combat encounter when the map is a simple sketch. That's how my original GM, and today me, could make a brand new map of literally any ridiculous location the players decide to get into on the fly in that session. Two, seamlessness. It is related to the first one, but being able to go from theater of mind, social, or exploration to quasi theater of mind combat just keeps the game on a more consistent level throughout these phases. Three, money. <laughs> you already own paper and pencils and pens and probably a screen you can draw on if you're watching this YouTube video, so it's completely free. Although plenty of gridded maps are free online, so this is mostly a comparison to physical terrain and miniatures, but that's really its own whole hobby, so we're not gonna get into that. And four, attitude. Maybe this is just me. But I feel like the more abstract my game is, the more I just enjoy the story, sitting back and conversing with my friends. So both of these methods, grid and gridless, have their own ways of adding some intensity to the game. Grids make every decision in combat matter, while gridless maps make combat fast and fluid. Now, Here's where I show my bias. The other cool part about gridless combat is that you can still keep some of the key features of tactical gridded play. Flanking? You don't even need a map to know that you can flank a monster in theater of mind as long as you have an ally who's also in melee with that same monster. Opportunity attacks? Easy. If you're in melee with a monster, but you or the opponent tries to move away, it triggers an opportunity attack. Area effects including spells or zones of difficult terrain? This is where all you really need is a modicum of trust and sportsmanship between the GM and the players just needing to be reasonable about who's in an area and who's not in an area. Though this is much easier with some kind of map than theater of mind. And I cannot emphasize this enough. Remember, all of those rules for D&D 5e were written with the default mode of play in mind to be gridless. Grids are a variant rule. So frankly, they just didn't do a great job of making these rules compatible with gridless play because everything is still defined by measurements in feet instead of more natural language that lends itself better to a more abstract view of things. Look at Daggerheart RPG, which uses all the same ranges for 5e combat, but just gives them each a name and a real world measuring stick. 
or theater of the mind, and map-based conflict. Very close is anywhere from like five to 10 feet away, or the shortest length of a game card when measured on a map. In fact, it was through reading and playing a bunch of different games that I realized gridded play is kind of unique. Most games just don't bother with it. Dungeon Crawl Classic states early on, combat does not require a battle map or grid or miniatures. If you find these game aids helpful, by all means, use them. However, the rules are written on the assumption that miniatures are optional. Skate Wizards and Cairn 1E just give every player character the same speed by default, and you can move and take an action on your turn. Incredibly simple, leaves everything wide open to the imagination. And Reason. Powered by the Apocalypse games and their kin, don't usually mention movement or range or zones at all. Movement only comes up in Candela as a type of action. Similarly, in Crown and Skull, every character can move the same distance by default, but on your turn, you can move or take an action, or you can do both, but with a consequence. And Index Card RPG kind of paved the way for Daggerheart's measurements with cards and pencils and paper by suggesting you measure things with a banana. And I think ICRPG also coined the range terminology used in Shadow Dark, close equals melee, near equals 30 feet and is the distance for normal movement, thrown weapons and some spells, and far equals in sight but out of reach, except with some ranged weapons and spells. So if you just love grids, grids are your thing, Godspeed. But if you feel like your combat is dragging from time to time, or you just want to move diagonally without doing math, I definitely suggest trying abstract maps where instead of 5 foot chunks, you just speed things up by using 30 foot chunks. Or maybe 10 foot chunks like a good old dungeon. Which can be way more fun with Delve. Plug and play dungeons, monsters, traps, puzzles, player options, contributions from your favorite creators, and the expertise of Eventier Games, who have already successfully published several 5e books through Kickstarter. Your support thus far has been incredible, and it's been amazing to see so much support for the Shattered Ark version as well as the 5e version. It really means a lot, and I can't wait to make this thing. So, thank you. Thank you to the Bob World Builder patrons, without whom I would have never gotten this far, and keep building. <laughs>